Okay, class, so in the last first part of today's lecture, we looked at membrane proteins, and now we're going to actually look where the membrane proteins are synthesized, how they're synthesized, and how they're put into the membrane. And also we're going to cover just general secreted proteins because they travel basically the same route because they have to get translocated into the ER. Okay, so all proteins that enter the secretory pathway, basically enter through the endoplasmic reticulum, right? They go from the cytosol to the endoplasmic reticulum. And then they're folded and sorted and glycosylated, and then eventually they'll be transported to the Golgi. But that's uh, uh, next, that's Thursday's lecture. Okay, so let's take a look at the endoplasmic reticulum. So here is just the um, endoplasmic reticulum stained in a mammalian cells. Um, and basically, this is where all of the lipids and all of the secreted proteins are synthesized, as well as transmembrane proteins that are part of um, the uh, organelles that are in the secretory pathway, and as well as the plasma membrane. Okay, the ER also serves as a calcium store, and we saw that when we were looking at IP3 signaling, how it goes in and it causes a release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, Here's just a, an immunofluorescence of the endoplasmic reticulum in plants, very similar. It's this um, tubular structure that goes throughout the cell. Um, and so to get a protein into the lumen of the ER or into the plasma membrane, the protein undergoes what's called translocation. Okay, so here you have a ribosome shown in green here. Uh, basically translating a messenger RNA, shown here in blue. And what ends up happening, all secreted proteins have a little signal sequence or leader peptide um, that starts to come out. And that's the signal that basically tells the cell that this is a secreted protein and it needs to be translocated into the ER. And that can undergo in two ways. You can have co-translational translocation where the ribosome is stalls and then gets associated with the with the ER membrane and starts to translocate through the translocation pore. And so it stalls here and then translation continues and the co-translational, it's translocated as it's being translated, which is co-translational translocation. The other method is post-translational translocation, which as the name implies, the protein becomes fully translated and then the signal sequence is recognized and that gets put into the translocation pore and the protein is then pulled through um, and into the ER. Um, and so here's just a, a nice EM of co-translational translocationing happening. You can see the endoplasmic reticulum and all of these little dark punctate things are ribosomes and they're co-translationally translocating proteins uh, into the ER. Okay, and so the rough ER is where all co-translational translocation is occurring. Um, and there's also smooth ER. This is um, endoplasmic reticulum that doesn't have any ribosomes and where translocation isn't occurring. This is where basically vesicles butt off um, that are then transported to the Golgi. Okay, and they can do this in, in a couple of different ways. They form these little vesicles that then fuse to form the ER to Golgi intermediate compartment or ERGIG or oftentimes called vesicular tubular clusters. Your um, textbook uses VTCs or vesicular tubular clusters, but this is also a very common name for that, um, which is seen in the literature a lot. Here's a nice uh, 3D reconstruction of the endoplasmic reticulum. I know if you go back to the immunofluorescence images, that sort of is hard to sort of visualize in three-dimensional space. But if you look here, you can sort of see that there's these sort of leaflets, and you have smooth ER as well as rough ER. And rough ER is where co-translational translocation is occurring versus the smooth ER where vesicles are budding off. Um, destined to uh, the Golgi apparatus or the vesicular tubular clusters. Um, so you can actually purify the endoplasmic reticulum. It's, it's quite simple. It's something I did in graduate school all the time. Um, and so here you can you create these what are called microsomes um, and you can see you can get rough ER 
as well as smooth ER in these microsomal fractions. Um, and the way to purify them is pretty simple. You gently lyse your cell, um, and then what you end up doing is homogenizing. So the um, smooth ER and the rough ER breaks up into what are these sort of rough and smooth microsomes. Then you can layer them onto a sucrose gradient. You centrifuge them for a while, and depending on the density, certain things will travel faster through the sucrose gradient than others, and then you can collect various fractions, and you can purify either your rough ER or your smooth ER. Um, and so by using s the purified microsomes, you can actually study translocation into the ER quite easily. Okay, so normally what you happen is free ribosomal subunits, and they'll bind to a messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA uh, will then start, will be then be translated, and then if you have a signal sequence, that tells it to go to the translocation pore, and it gets put into the translocation pore, and then you have co-translational translocation, where the protein is being fed through, and the signal sequence, oftentimes, especially if it's a secreted protein, will get cleaved off by this protein called signal peptidase. And then once the protein is fully translocated into the ER, it gets glycosylated and then it's folded up, okay? Um, and so it's this leader sequence and the signal peptidase that cleaves the leader sequence or the signal sequence um, that sort of makes the protein sort of soluble here. Okay, because the, oftentimes the signal sequence is a little stretch of hydrophobic amino acids. Um, now, for co-translational translocation to occur, um, you have this thing called signal recognition particle. This actually recognizes the signal sequence as the messenger RNA is being translated on the ribosome. So as the messenger RNA is being translated, the signal sequence will start to come out, and then SRP, signal recognition particle, um, actually gets uh, recognizes the hydrophobic patch on the signal sequence, and then it has this long arm with the hinge domain, um, which then actually binds to the other side of the ribosome and stalls translocation until SRP is bound by the SRP receptor, and then it releases it, and so you can have co-translational translocation. Um, I'll explain this in the next slide a little bit better. Um, just a little note, one of the authors of your textbook, uh, Peter Walter, um, he's one of the six or seven authors on your textbook, he actually discovered this protein. Um, so just thought I would tell you guys that, okay? Um, so ultimately, though, SRP binds to a signal sequence as it's beginning to emerge um, from the uh, coat as it's beginning to emerge from the ribosome, the translating ribosome, okay? So SRP is going to bind this little signal sequence right here. Um, and the way it works is here you have your small ribosomal subunit and your large ribosomal subunit, and as translation is occurring, the signal sequence will come out, and then signal recognition particle will bind to that signal sequence, and when it binds to it, it sort of wraps around and then associates with the other end of the ribosome and stalls translation. Okay, so once a secreted protein messenger RNA is being translated and enough of the signal sequence starts to come out, SRP will bind to that signal sequence and stall translation, okay? And so this, right now, the ribosome is out in the cytosol, and then once it's bound by SRP, SRP will help bring the stalled ribosome to the endoplasmic reticulum, and then uh, in this sort of fashion. So here you have a translating a ribosome and with a tRNA and it's making and the signal sequence starts to become exposed SRP binds and that actually causes translation to be stalled okay the SRP is then bound by the SRP receptor which then brings it to the protein translocation pore um, and then the signal sequence gets inserted and then you have co-translational translocation um, and SRP is eventually um, released after the signal sequence gets put in. Um, it releases the signal sequence, gets embedded in the translocation pore, and then co-translational translocation can proceed. Okay. Um, and because translation is no longer stalled by SRP. 
Um, and so what ends up happening is you have your sort of free pool of ribosomal subunits, your small and your large, and that'll find a messenger RNA. And depending on whether or not it's a secreted protein, if the messenger RNA is encoding a secreted protein, you'll get your ER signal sequence, SRP will bind, it guides the ribosome uh, to the endoplasmic reticulum by binding to the SRP receptor, and then the signal sequence will get embedded into the translocation pore, and then you have co-translational translocation occurring, okay? And once the translation is done, the free ribosomal subunits are released, and they can go back and, and bind to any messenger RNA that's out in the cytosol, which can be a secreted protein, um, and then you can get your polyribosome. So you can have basically your soluble polyribosomes uh, sort of translating um, a soluble protein, a, a soluble cytosolic protein, or if it has a signal sequence, it's bound by SRP and is brought to the endoplasmic reticulum, and then you can have um, a membrane-bound polyribosome that's basically making your um, secreted protein. Um, here's an example of sort of a polyribosome over here. You can see that there's many, and they're just sort of sitting on the face of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and these also form that sort of uh, Rosetta-like pattern that, that we saw before when we were looking at translocation in the cytosol. Not translocation, in the translation in the cytosol. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, so the translocation pore is basically composed of the SEC61 complex, um, and here is the structure of it. It has this sort of central plug in the middle, and so when it's closed, the plug sort of is shut, um, but then when you get a, a signal sequence embedded into it, it'll sort of push it to the side, and then the growing polypeptide is basically threaded through where the plug normally would be, and the plug actually gets displaced. Okay, so... Um, um, so once again, the, the signal sequence is actually associated with the pore as the uh, growing poly, polypeptide chain is sort of fed through the, the, the central domain where normally this plug is. Okay. Um, so here's a nice uh, cryo-EM image of the ribosome bound to the translocation pore. Here's sort of a side image of it, and here's sort of looking from the bottom. Um, and so what ends up happening is the protein is sort of guided through the translocation pore, okay? And it just sort of sits there. Um, um, so here's just the, the way things work between co-translational versus um, post-translational. So in co-translational translocation, the signal sequence will be exposed from the ribosome, SRP will bind to it, stall translation, bring it to the um, the ER membrane, um, and then translation can proceed, and signal peptidase cleaves the signal peptide, and the protein is fed through the translocation pore. Um, in post-translational translocation, you can oftentimes have the protein synthesized out in the cytosol, and the signal sequence is recognized, brought in, and it's sort of fed through. And then using this ER chaperone called BIP, this is an HSP70 family member, um, that actually uses ATP to actually pull the um, protein through the translocation pore. And in bacteria, it works kind of similar, except instead of BIP, you have this protein called SEC-A, which is also an ATPase, which actually sort of threads the um, protein uh, through from the cytosol into the extracellular space, okay? But this is really the, the ones that I want you guys to know, okay? Um, so once again, here's sort of a, a close-up of uh, post-translational translocation. Here is your secreted protein, um, and it gets sort of inserted into the translocation pore, and then uh, BIP actually uses ATP, binds to stretches on the protein and helps sort of pull it through, uh, through pull the whole through protein through the translocation pore. Um, so 
for translocating soluble proteins, once again, you're still going to have that signal sequence. It will get um, sort of embedded into the translocation pore. Signal peptidase will clean, cleave the signal peptide, and then it's either pulled through by BIP in post-translational translocation, or it's sort of fed through in co-translational translocation as it's being translated on the ribosome. And eventually you will have your protein in the, in the lumen of the ER. Okay, this is your mature soluble protein, at which point disulfide bonds will form, the protein will get glycosylated and other things. So just in general, one of the important things to know here is that secreted proteins will get multiple processing events that happen. Okay, the, the signal sequence can get cleaved um, and uh, the protein can get the formation of disulfide bonds and the protein can also get glycosylated. And we'll look at glycosylation in a second. Um, now, in the case with transmembrane proteins, um, you're still going to have your sort of leader peptide that tells it that this needs to go to the endoplasmic reticulum, but as it's being translated or, um, or if it's post-translationally translocated, you have this stop transfer sequence. Okay, so the signal sequence gets embedded. You can sort of think of it as a start transfer sequence. Um, it will then get cleaved by signal peptidase, and as the stop transfer sequence gets into the pore, it stops basically translocating. Um, and then it's just released from the pore, and then you have your transmembrane domain. Okay, in this case, the amino terminal end is in the lumen of the ER, whereas the, the carboxyl terminal end is still located in the cytoplasm. Okay, and these stop transfer sequences are oftentimes encoded by um, hydrophobic patches um, that basically form a, uh, you know, transmembrane alpha helix. Now, in the case with single-pass transmembrane domains, they can either um, have their amino terminal end in the cytosol or their amino terminal end in the lumen of the ER. Okay, and oftentimes these will just have a single transmembrane domain um, and that will get embedded, and depending on how it gets embedded, um, it will sort of either have the carboxy terminal end in the cytosol or the amino terminal end in the cytosol. And you can't tell from a protein sequence which it's going to be. This has to be determined empirically for all proteins. Um, so in general, you can put tags on the proteins to find out what, um, what side of the, the membrane um, either the amino terminal or carboxy terminal end is in the cytosol versus what is in the lumen. So this is sometimes can be somewhat complicated. And the point here for you guys to know is that, you know, just because a protein has a start transfer sequence um, in the middle of it, you can't tell just by looking at it if it's going to be um, have its amino terminal in the cytosol or its cytoplasmic region in the cytosol. And here's just the two mechanisms by which it happens, okay? It can be embedded and the amino terminal end sticks in um, and then the, the carboxy terminal end is pulled through or um, the amino terminal end can be actually be pulled through and released. For membrane proteins that have multiple um, membrane-spanning alpha helices, you have multiple stop transfers and multiple start transfers. Okay, and once again, it's not necessarily intuitive where the amino terminal end is going to be either in the cytosol or in the ER lumen. It's, it's impossible to tell. You have to determine it empirically. But this is sort of a nice schematic to sort of show you what happens. You'll have a start transfer sequence that's sort of embedded into the translocation pore, and then it'll sort of be pulled through, presumably by BIP, until it hits a stop transfer, and then the protein is actually released from the translocation port. And in this instance, both the amino terminal and carboxy terminal end are stuck in the cytosol um, versus the mature portion, which is in the endoplasmic reticulum. In the case with um, things that have multiple transmembrane domains, transmembrane spanning alpha helices, um, which you can sort of see in this hydro 
hydrophobicity plot up here, um, you can oftentimes have multiple starts. So there's your first start transfer, and then you get another start, and then a stop, and then a start, and then a stop, and then a start, and then a stop. Okay, so you can sort of think of this almost as a G protein coupled receptor. And once again, whether or not the amino terminal end or the carboxy terminal end is in the cytosol versus the ER lumen, that has to be determined empirically. Um, so on to glycosylation. So proteins that enter the endoplasmic reticulum actually get glycosylated. Um, some cytosolic proteins get glycosylated too, but for the sake of this course, um, it's just the glycosylation in the ER that we're really concerned with. Okay, and the amino acid that, that tends to get glycosylated the most is asparagine, or N, which is why it's called N-linked glycosylation. Um, and so here you can see the asparagine side chain, and then glycosylation just means that you get these sugar moieties added onto the protein, okay? Um, and so here you can sort of see you have um, N-acetylglucosamine, then you have mannose, and then glucose. Um, and most secreted proteins and all luminal resident proteins um, are pretty much uh, glycosylated, while most cytosolic proteins are not. But in general, 50% of all the proteins in the cell is glyco are glycosylated. Um, so here's uh, how it happens. You have an, an oligosaccharyl transferase, and as a protein is being translocated into the endoplasmic reticulum, the oligosaccharyl transferase actually takes your oligosaccharide, which is normally attached to a lipid, and then it gets um, inserted and attached and covalently attached to the growing polypeptide. All right, so this is just N-linked glycosylation happening in the ER. Um, here's how the lipid-linked oligosaccharides are, are sort of formed. You have um, your Dolacol here, and then basically it starts to, it adds a phosphate, and then you add on um, some glucnax, uh, and then some mannoses, and then it basically gets flipped in the membrane, and more of the sugar moieties get put on the mannoses, um, and then the uh, UDP glucose actually adds uh, the glucose to it, okay? Um, and then this will eventually get attached to the protein. Um, now, one of the things that the cell does with this glycosylation is it helps to fold secreted proteins. Okay, so normally when a protein gets secreted into the ER, it's sort of fed through as a polypeptide chain. Um, and then once it's sort of in there, the glucose will actually get trimmed. Um, and then it binds to this protein in the ER lumen, um, uh, calnexin, and then the glucosidases will, so this will help to fold it, and then the glucosidases will remove the glucose, and you're left with an N-link oligosaccharide, and if it's not folded properly, you'll get the glucose added back on by uh, glucosyl transferase, and the, the glucose is added back on, and it completely will stay in this loop until the protein um, is folded. And eventually, when it's folded properly, it gets released from the quality control machinery, at which point then it can be, um, it can actually exit the endoplasmic reticulum as a folded protein. Okay, so this is just sort of designed to sort of show you the steps that are involved in folding a protein in the ER. And in this whole process, there's other things that are happening, like, um, Protein disulfide isomerase is actually adding, uh, causing the formation of disulfides and other things until the protein is fully folded. Um, in the event that a protein doesn't get folded, it's actually transported out of the endoplasmic reticulum in a process called retrograde translocation. Okay, so if a protein is misfolded, it's bound by a chaperone, and that chaperone will help the protein translocate out of the ER, um, and then the glycosylation is removed, 
and you get ubiquitin added to the protein and then that's recognized by the proteasome and then all of the amino acids are actually recycled and, and used again. Okay, so if a protein gets misfolded in the ER, it's oftentimes translocated out um, and um, almost always translocated out and then gets uh, the glycosylation removed and then ubiquitilated and degraded by the proteasome. Now, in the event that a number of proteins start to sort of build up in the ER as unfolded proteins, you end up, the cell undergoes this thing called the unfolded protein response, okay? And so you have these sensors in the ER membrane that can sense when proteins are building up in the endoplasmic reticulum, one of which is called IRE1, the other is called PERC, and then there is ATF6. Okay, and when proteins build up in the endoplasmic, when unfolded proteins build up in the endoplasmic reticulum, these proteins get activated. Okay, so these undergo a cross-phosphorylation event. In the case with IRE1, it then um, is involved in regulating splicing of a messenger RNA that then allows um, a gene regulatory protein to be properly translated, and then that goes into the nucleus and upregulates expression of uh, ER chaperones and proteins needed for folding. Um, in the case with PERC, uh, when it gets activated, it cross-phosphorylates itself, and what PERC does is it reduces um, protein translation, or it, it selectively translates proteins that are involved in gene regulation, which also will then go on, enter into the nucleus, and regulate specific transcription, okay? So the reduction in translation prevents the more proteins um, from entering the endoplasmic reticulum. And likewise, ATF6, when it becomes activated, there's a regulated proteolysis that releases a, a gene regulatory protein, which then goes into the nucleus and can drive transcription. So in general, when there's a buildup of misfolded proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum, it's sensed by IRE1, PERC, or ATF6, um, which then can change the transcriptional program in the cell to deal with that buildup of unfolded proteins, mainly through um, increasing transcription of ER chaperones and other things like that. Um, so this is a really good schematic and something that I want you guys to all know. Um, and so this is basically activation of the unfolded protein response and specifically IRE1. So if you have an unfolded protein that starts to build up in the endoplasmic reticulum, that's actually sensed by IRE1, which is a transmembrane protein kinase. It cross-phosphorylates itself and dimerizes. And once it's phosphorylated and it dimerizes, it actually undergoes regulated splicing, where it splices a pre-messenger RNA. Um, it removes the intron, and then you have your messenger RNA that um, encodes for a gene regulatory protein that then enters into the nucleus, and it will bind upstream of genes that, are in, that basically encode chaperones and drive expression of chaperone mRNAs. That chaperone mRNA is then uh, translocated or transported out of the nucleus and then undergoes co-translational translocation and then you start to produce more ER chaperone which can then go and bind and help fold all of the unfolded proteins. Okay, pretty straightforward um, with this process. Um, once again, the, the, one of the authors of your textbook, Peter Walter, actually worked out this whole process here. Um, and what's kind of cool about this is this is actually a, an example of regulated mRNA splicing that's actually occurring in the cytosol. Most splicing occurs in the nucleus. However, in this instance, you have actually regulated splicing that's occurring in the cytosol. Okay, um, GPI anchors. We talked about these um, in the first section, um, and I also mentioned that these are sort of enriched in lipid rafts. And so here you have a GPI anchored protein. It has its signal sequence. The signal sequence actually gets cleaved, 
and then um, the protein gets covalently attached to um, glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol. This is a lipid anchor. Um, and then you have your GPI anchored protein. And this will then be sorted in the ER, transported to the Golgi in a vesicle, um, where it continually gets glycosylated, um, and then eventually it will end up on the extracellular surface of the plasma membrane um, and sort of become embedded in a lipid raft or enriched in a lipid raft. Um, so here's uh, basically how lipid synthesis occurs. This is the synthesis of phosphatidylcholine. So you'll have your fatty acid that gets embedded into the membrane, and then you get um, uh, coenzyme A attached to it by coenzyme A uh, transferase, and then you'll get the addition of glycerol 3-phosphate, and then you can have choline um, attached to it by choline um, phosphotransferase, and that's how, based, and then you're left with phosphatidylcholine. Okay, so no, not you don't necessarily have to memorize this, but I really want you guys to appreciate that that most lipids are actually made on the cytoplasmic face of the endoplasmic reticulum, um, and then they get sorted um, and flipped. So this happens to be just the example that your book chose to show you how phosphatidylcholine um, is made. And you can go back to last week's lecture um, where we were covering lipids and look at the structure of um, phosphatidylcholine. I think that it would be a, a good exercise for all of you guys to do, or you can flip through your book to find it. So, um, so once the lipids are made um, on the cytosolic face of the ER membrane. They actually get sorted and flipped, okay? So you get the, the lipids added to it, um, and this protein called scrambolase actually can start to sort of move and, and flip the lipids around. Um, and you can also have an, an enzyme that uh, sort of organizes lipids on the plasma membrane. It's this enzyme called flipase, where you can actually flip and sort of sort the, uh, the lipids. Right, and when we saw last lecture how the lipids form all of these sort of lipid subdomains and things like that. Um, and you can go back to some of those charts and look at what lipids are enriched in what certain organelles or the plasma membrane, what's on the inner leaflet versus the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. Okay, so that's um, it for today. Uh, so next Thursday, this coming Thursday, we're going to do uh, vesicle transport, one of my favorite lectures, um, just to give you guys a little heads up. Uh, try to get your reading done ahead of time. Um, and once again, just a reminder, the second exam is going to be on April 7th. I still haven't fully decided how I'm going to administer the exam to you guys. I have to be perfectly honest, I've heard nightmares about Proctor Track. Um, I listened to a sort of webinar this morning on using Canvas, um, and so I may do it that way. Um, I don't know if you guys have any opinions on these things. I'm sure at this point in time you've had other exams and other classes. I'd love to get some feedback from you guys on how you would like it. Um, a third option that I'm considering is also just picking uh, questions from your textbook at the end of each chapter that we covered. Um, some of those are um, uh, interesting in that they're pretty challenging questions, um, and that would be sort of a take-home exam where I would just give you that and give you a whole bunch of questions and let you fill it out. Um, i sort of hesitant to do that. Um, because I know how busy you are, but I do really like some of the questions in your textbook. Um, they're, uh, you know, sort of really challenging and make you not only understand all the material, but then sort of take it to the next level, like what would happen if, or how does this work? Um, and so I think that might actually work well too. So I'm leaning against the Proctor track just because once again, I've heard nightmares about it. I'm gonna look into Canvas. I just learned about Canvas and the exams in Canvas. I'm sure you guys have all used Canvas or in some of your other courses. So I'm gonna look into that as a possible option um, but like I said, as a fallback, we might do that. So it might be good for some of you guys to start looking at some of the questions um, in 
the end of your your textbook because they're, they're really great questions i haven't given you guys any of them to do just because i think they're really challenging and there's enough reading in this course that i think it would be too much time consuming for you guys to, to give you a lot of homework assignments with those questions um, however i think they some of them would make great exam questions um, and allow you to really sort of think about things and do that but that would be with a take-home exam um, so I'd love to hear some of your feedback if you guys just want to send me an email and say uh, I've taken Canvas exams in, in other classes and I love them. I think it would be a great way to do it. Um, or, you know, you can sit there and, and vote for potential take-home exam and really difficult, challenging questions. So, um, and I haven't fully decided what I'm going to do, but feedback from you guys is always appreciated. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying these video lectures. Um, once again, if you want to give me feedback on them, I've heard from a couple people that said they really like them. Um, I'm trying to do my best with them. I know they can be somewhat of a challenge. I, uh, it's difficult talking to a screen. I don't know if you guys um, have ever had that experience yet, but you, it's a lot easier talking face to face. So, um, so with that, I guess um, I'll call that a day and I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I'll see you guys on Thursday. All right. Bye-bye.